Okay, so I'm going to get started with the next presentation. Uh, so I'm going to be giving everyone an introduction to microfluidics and we'll be covering some basics and applications. And this is pretty relevant to some of the stuff that you're going to be learning in Module 3 of the course, which is the hands-on lab session. So to start with, I'm going to give a bit of an outline of the presentation. So we'll start by defining microfluidics, and then we'll talk about why it's important to us. After that, we'll get into some basics of fluid mechanics, which will be useful to get us all onto the same page, like because we're all from different backgrounds here. So we're going to cover like some really basic fluid mechanics. And then we'll be able to look a little closer at the special phenomena associated with the micro scale. Um, and then to cap off the presentation, we'll talk about some fun applications of microfluidics uh, specific to micro and nano biotechnology. So to start with, what is microfluidics? Uh, so microfluidics is the science of fluid dynamics at the micro scale. And uh, so microfluidics handle volumes of liquids in the microliter, nanoliter, and picoliter range, which means that microfluidic chips are typically very small, and they also don't consume very much energy. And as well, due to the very small size of microfluidic channels, which are about the same width as a human hair, uh, microfluidics can make use of special fluid dynamics uh, phenomena, which become uh, relevant at the micro scale. So we're going to talk a little bit more about this part later in the presentation. So why microfluidics? What we're talking about is taking typical fluidic processes such as blood sampling, uh, DNA synthesis, and PCR amplification, and dramatically <coughs> scaling down the size. But what benefit can this offer us? So the benefits of miniaturization are, have been most obvious in the field of microelectronics. Uh, so as the size of electrical components have decreased, their potential and versatility have increased. We can now make devices small enough to implant inside the human body, such as uh, pacemakers and cochlear implants. So a natural question to ask would be whether or not we can miniaturize biological and chemical processes to the same extent and if we did, would we see consequences as dramatic? So microfluidics seeks to achieve this goal. By decreasing the size and performing many experiments in parallel, we can perform our exper experiments faster and we can obtain more reliable results. And additionally, the small size of the system itself makes novel tasks possible. So uh, it gives us the ability to, for example, interact with individual cells, uh, multiplex reactions and uh, do in vitro modeling of physiological microsystems, which is what we're seeing here. This is a liver on a chip. Uh, so we're going to talk more about applications later, but just a teaser to the exciting last section of the presentation. So the first point I wanted to make about the benefits of microfluidics are uh, quantitative benefits. So using miniature devices, you may be able to do more for a lower cost. And by cost here, we're talking economically and ecologically. So this comes from the potential for using batch fabrication processes, uh, the potential for parallelizing our reactions, and also consuming uh, smaller volumes of samples and reagents. So as well, we can do away with some large, expensive pieces of scientific equipment and possibly replace these pieces of equipment with microfluidic chips which also reduces the cost burden of research and uh, makes this kind of science more accessible to a lot of different labs. And the second point I wanted to make about advantages uh, is making our analyses more high throughput. So when we do an experiment in the lab, we typically have a number of different steps. And sometimes each of these different steps can require a different piece of equipment and probably also multiple technicians or grad students to operate all these pieces of equipment. And so that makes this whole process really expensive. But if we scale down, uh, if well, we have a vision in microfluidics, which is the lab on a chip devices, which would mean <coughs> scaling down the size of the reaction and being able to perform each of these tasks on a single microfluidic chip. And as well, we can um, even put parallel, we can uh, perform multiple experiments in parallel make the analysis faster and obtain more reliable results by doing away with a lot of the 
human error associated with the macrofluidic devices here. So for some systems, um, an experiment conducted using a lab-on-a-chip device could even be automated, which just further makes it easier for us. So now that we know about the what and the why, we're going to get into some basics of fluid mechanics. So in the field of fluid mechanics, we can rely on a few different laws and assumptions uh, when we're doing our calculations. So the first law is the conservation of mass. And basically, this states that a system's mass remains constant over time. Or in other words, that mass can neither be created nor destroyed. And this is something that we're probably all familiar with. Uh, as well, we have the law of conservation of momentum. So just for those of us who might not remember, momentum is simply the product of an object's mass and its energy. And the second law states that a system's momentum will also stay constant over time. And this is illustrated here with these... Uh, billiard balls. Uh, the first assumption that we can rely on, which is particularly applicable at the micro scale, is the assumption of incompressibility, which basically states that a fluid's volume does not change with pressure. And uh, finally, no slip boundary conditions is the last assumption, and that's best illustrated by this video. Which is, yes, okay. So here we can see a knife being dipped into some honey. And when the knife is removed, the fluid can flow freely from the surface of the honey due to the force being applied, which is gravity in this case. But we'll notice that a thin layer of honey will remain on the knife, and that's because the velocity of this thin layer of honey at the surface is zero. And uh, it's a similar situation when we see a capillary filled with dye being lowered into a water bath with some flow rate. So you can see here that some of the dye, a thin layer, remains stuck to the knife. And that's because the velocity at, of this thin layer is zero. Uh, so those are the assumptions we can make when we're speaking about fluid mechanics. And in general, this applies for different types of liquid as well as different types of flow. And there are two of each of these cases. Uh, the first, uh, so Newtonian, different types of liquid are Newtonian fluids and non-Newtonian fluids. And so Newtonian fluids are probably the ones we're most familiar with, such as water, air, oil, etc. A uh, non-Newtonian fluid is one in which the viscosity depends on applied stress, such as ketchup. So we've all probably had the experience of upending a bottle of ketchup over a plate and finding that the ketchup just won't come out of the bottle. Um, but if we apply greater stress to the fluid, such as by smacking the bottle, it flows readily. So uh, the viscosity can be changed by applying force. And uh, the two different types of flow that we're going to talk about are laminar and turbulent. So a laminar flow is one in which fluid particles move in smooth paths and slide over top of each other in lakes, such as honey dripping from a spoon. <clears throat> and a turbulent flow is chaotic and stochastic, such as water gushing from a tap. So uh, just first we're going to talk about types of fluid. So, um, every flu flowing fluid is subject to viscous stresses from the surrounding fluid. So, in uh, so these viscous stresses cause strain within the fluid, which leads to uh, deformation or flow over time. And in a Newtonian fluid, uh, the viscosity is independent of the applied stress. And so there's a linear relationship between the stress and the strain, as can be seen for this graph. So the equation for shear stress, which is tau, is shown here. And we can see that it's proportional to the rate of change of fluid layer velocity, which is v, in the y direction. And the proportionality constant in this equation is the viscosity, which is given by the slope of these lines here. And these are uh, ratios of shearing stress to shearing strain for common fluids at a given reference temperature and pressure. So viscosity for Newtonian fluids is constant for given temperatures. But what is viscosity? Um, viscosity is a measure of the internal resistance to flow, which comes from friction between fluid layers. So here we can see some viscosity values for common Newtonian fluids uh, at a given temperature, of course. So one thing you, that you might notice here is that thinner fluids tend to have a lower viscosity. So for example, water is thinner than oil, 
and water has a lower viscosity value than oil does. Uh, so as a pop quiz, can anyone identify a non-Newtonian fluid in this list? That's right, it's honey. <laughs> so because, uh, because we just learned that viscosity is constant for Newtonian fluids, we can expect to report it as a single value and not a range of values. So honey here is a non-Newtonian fluid. <clears throat> And a non-Newtonian fluid is one in which there is a non-linear relationship between shear stress and shear strain, which is the deformation which causes flow. So we can see that from this graph. So the linear relationship is the Newtonian fluid, and there's non-Newtonian fluids can exhibit either shear thickening behavior or shear thinning behavior. So one example of shear thickening behavior is shown in this video which I will start. So this man is sitting in a pool of uh, cornstarch mixed with water. And since he's sitting still, he's not applying much stress to the fluid, and he can sink into it. However, when a greater stress is applied to the fluid, such as by feet running or jumping over the surface, the fluid will thicken, or the viscosity will increase. And it does so to the extent that it can support the second, second person's weight. So uh, shear thickening fluid is one in which the viscosity increases with applied stress. And uh, one example of shear thinning behavior is shown with blood. So blood, we all know, flows readily in capillaries and blood vessels. But if you ever have cut your arm or your leg, you might notice that the blood tends to pool and doesn't drip. And so a shear thinning fluid is one in which the viscosity decreases with applied stress. And this is particularly important for us uh, when we're talking about microfluidics because some microfluidic chips are designed to handle patient samples, which would be physiological fluids such as blood or sputum or something. And so these uh, can be non-Newtonian. And it's really important for us to understand how non-Newtonian fluids will rep respond to uh, applied stresses mm -hmm. and how they will flow in our microfluidic channels. So speaking of flow, now we can get into the two different types of flow that we're going to be talking about, and these are laminar and turbulent. So laminar flow, as I mentioned before, is one in which fluid particles or small unit volumes of uh, fluid move smoothly over top of each other in layers. And most of the energy losses in a laminar flow regime are due to viscous effects because viscosity dominates over inertia in these laminar flow regimes. Contrasted to that is turbulent flow, which is an unsteady flow where fluid particles move in irregular paths and they move chaotically and they're always like crossing into each other. And in this kind of regime, inertial forces dominate over viscous effects. So finally, the Reynolds number is a measure of flow turbulence. And typically for Reynolds numbers below 2,000, uh, we can, are for laminar flow regimes. Uh, so the Reynolds number is given by this equation here. And we can see that this, in this equation, it's proportional to the characteristic length, L, of the channel. And the characteristic length is itself proportional to the cross-sectional area of the channel. So in microfluidic systems, where we're talking about channels that are about the same width as a human hair, the Reynolds number is often below 1. And that would indicate a superlaminar or creeping flow. So, in this video, we can watch the transition between laminar and turbulent flow. Uh, so, as the velocity of the flow rate of the fluid increases, the flow moves from moving in a straight line, which would indicate laminar here, to moving more and more chaotically, and finally becoming so turbulent that it starts to completely mix in the channel. So from a microfluidics perspective, uh, we are more interested in laminar flow because of these small channel dimensions. So I'm going to show you two simple cases of laminar flow. Uh, in the Kuwait flow regime, we have two plates that are parallel to each other with some fluid in between. And in this case, the fluid is oil. And it has uh, this square of dye there. And so you can see when one of the plates begins rotating, the no-slip boundary condition, which applies at both plates, causes uh, viscous drag forces to be exerted on the fluid. And so it starts moving over top of each other with this kind of profile. 
Um, contrasted to that is Poiseuille flow. So in the Poiseuille regime, the flow is driven by a pressure applied to the fluid. So in this channel, we have oil, and then there's a thin layer of miscible dye here, which is going to illustrate the velocity profile that we're going to see. So because the no-slip condition applies at both the walls of the channel, uh, we end up with this parabolic velocity profile from the applied pressure. So it's important to note that in both these examples, in Couette and Poiseuille flow, the videos I'm showing you are not microfluidic examples. These are macrofluidic examples, um, and the fluid is oil. So the flow is laminar partially because the fluid has a high viscosity. So why am I even talking about this right now? It's because of the special phenomena that I've been hinting at up until now. So as I mentioned before, in small channel dimensions, we have laminar flow, where viscous effects dominate. So even when we're looking at water in a microfluidic channel, we would see it behave as a highly viscous fluid which is why it's important to know about these types of flow regimes. So this brings us to the next section of the presentation, which is a discussion of the special <coughs> phenomena associated with the microscale. So at the microscale, phenomena such as laminar flow, diffusion, capillary effects, and surface energy dominate. And we're going to talk about the how and the why. And we're going to start with the laminar flow and its impact on mixing. So the behavior of fluids at the microscale differ from macrofluidic behavior, as we've already seen. Flows are laminar due to the small channel dimensions, which is nicely illustrated by this image here. So here we see a series of flows entering into a microfluidic channel, creating multiple fluidic interfaces, which are illustrated by the different colors of the fluids. So uh, these fluids can move into the main channel in straight paths, and they can flow side by side without crossing into each other. And this is really great for us in microfluidics because it allows us to retain very precise control over fluids and be able to predict exactly where they're going to go in our system. But it does make it a little difficult when you're trying to accomplish something like mixing. So typically when you're mixing like a solution in the lab or like in the kitchen, <laughs> You do it by making, applying a lot of force to the fluid and making it really turbulent. You need to cross different parts of the, fluid, the mixture into each other. Um, but in microfluidics, we can't do that. It's very, very difficult to achieve turbulent flow. So uh, the way that mixing is typically accomplished in microfluidic systems is by diffusion across a fluidic <coughs> interface of two laminar flows flowing side by side. So diffusion is the transport of particles along a concentration gradient solely by the action of Brownian motion. So we can see here that as particles move from the high concentration side into the low concentration side, the net flow decreases. And this is because the system is reaching equilibrium, which is defined as the state at which the net flow is zero, or in other words, that the number of molecules entering into one side of the channel is balanced by the number of molecules exiting into the one. The exiting this side of the channel. So the time taken to reach equilibrium is given by this equation here, in which D is the diffusion constant. And so different molecules have different diffusion constants. So for example, a molecule such as urea has a higher diffusion constant, and so it would take much less time to reach equilibrium for a given length of the fluidic interface. Um, so diffusion will also occur at an interface where you have two different solutions containing different solutes. So you're going to have diffusion going from one side of the channel into the other, and then diffusion from this side of the channel into the blue side. And this is illustrated in this um, image by using just food, food coloring dye in water. So at the beginning of the fluidic channel, you can see that the interface is very clear and defined between the blue and yellow dyes. But the longer that these two laminar flows spend in contact with each other, the more and more blurry it starts to get. And you start to even see some green coming, which is just the mixture of the yellow and blue dyes. And by the time it gets to the end of the channel, it's uh, quite blurry and there's a distinct band of green in the middle. And so from this image, we might also be able to infer that uh, the yellow dye molecule actually has a higher diffusion constant than the blue dye molecule. And this is simply because you can see at the end of the channel that the yellow seems to have diffused completely into the blue side, whereas the blue 
has not managed to diffuse completely into the yellow side. So diffusion across multiple fluidic interfaces is really important pardon me, when you're talking about generating biochemical gradients. So a microfluidic circuit like this is capable of generating a gradient in the output channel here. So by applying multiple different solutions at the inlets and creating multiple fluidic, parallel fluidic interfaces, we can give uh, the solutions enough time by flowing through these serpentine channels to diffuse into each other and create a nice concentration profile here, which is indicated by this image. So in this image, uh, unfortunately, you can't see the inlets, but in the inlets, you would have yellow, blue, and red. And what you get out of it is yellow, green, blue, purple, and red. So uh, you're going to learn more about this later on, because as I said, there are experiments in Module 3, which you will all get to participate in. So next in our discussion of the special microfluidic phenomena, we can talk about uh, capillary effects and surface energy. So one of the most startling examples of capillary action is illustrated by this tree. So despite the enormous height of this tree, huge volumes of water managed to make it all the way from the roots up to the leaves without the benefit of a pump. And this is due to the capillary action inside microfluidic vasculature in the tree. Capillary action is also responsible for liquid creeping in a straw, which is something that we've probably all encountered at least at one point or another. So this capillary creeping uh, or sorry, the capillary action occurs in order to balance pressures. So we know that the pressure at the bottom of a liquid tube can be given by this equation here, which is P equals rho GH, where rho is just the density of the fluid, G is the uh, force of gravity, and H is the height or rise of liquid in the column. As well, we know that there's some pressure exerted at the interface between immiscible fluids, such as water and air which is given by this equation here. So at equilibrium, these two pressures are going to balance, which means that we can equate this equation to this equation, and we can rearrange it to determine the height of the liquid column. And we can see from this equation here that the height of the liquid column depends on the surface tension given by gamma, as well as the radius of the column given by R. So the rise of the meniscus depends uh, on these two variables here. So surface tension, which was given by gamma, uh, is just basically a property of the cohesion of the liquid. So surfaces are actually just interfaces between two immiscible liquids. Um, most commonly, the one we probably think of first is the interface between water and air. And so whenever an interface is created, the distribution of cohesive forces is going to become asymmetric. <coughs> And molecules in the bulk liquid will pull on molecules at the surface. Molecules at the surface will make stronger bonds with their neighbors. And this allows the surface of a liquid to resist a, an external force, which is shown by this video. So in this video, we can see uh, a razor blade being placed on the surface of water. And despite the fact that the metal in the razor blade is more dense than the water, it will sit on top until sufficient force is applied to overcome the surface tension effect. But conversely, when you put a, um, a heavier razor blade, it will just sink immediately into the water. So there is a limit to the uh, weight that surface tension can hold up. So another aspect of surface tension is the wettability of the surface. And, uh, <coughs> So when a liquid is placed in contact with the surface, cohesive and adhesive forces have to balance at equilibrium. So adhesion is the attraction of molecules in the liquid to molecules of the surface. I should use this one. Whereas cohesion is the attraction of liquid molecules to each other. So at equilibrium, the way that adhesive and cohesive forces balance is by changing the interfacial area between the liquid and the solid. So in, uh, in uh, the situation where cohesive forces are stronger than adhesive forces, the li uh, a liquid droplet would take a more spherical shape, as can be seen here. And so the measurement of the contact angle would increase. The contact angle is the way that we can uh, determine the, is a measurement of the wettability of the surface. 
So uh, a surface in which uh, the contact angle is higher than 90 degrees would be classified as hydrophobic. And in the opposite case, in a situation where adhesive forces dominate over cohesive forces, you would see a liquid droplet uh, spread or wet the surface, and the, co uh, the contact angle would go down. And this would be a hydrophilic surface. So both of these pictures here show PDMS. And PDMS is uh, a substrate which is most commonly used for microfluidic chips. And it's, uh, it's got some special properties which we can make use of. Uh, once it's cured, it's a polymer. So after it's cured, it's hydrophobic. But it can easily be plasma treated to make it hydrophilic, as in this case here. So we require hydrophilic PDMS channels for capillary systems such as this one. So this is a capillary system which has been molded in PDMS and then plasma treated. And it's being filled with dyed water. So in capillary systems uh, where we've changed the wettability of the inside channels, uh, we can cause the liquid to self-fill or spontaneously wet the channels. And again, you're going to learn more about this later because there is an experiment in module three. So, um, so finally, we can get into some of the more exciting stuff about microfluidics and lab-on-a-chip devices. So uh, just a brief chart. These are just some of the applications of microfluidics. And there's, uh, honestly, there's far too many for me to talk about here. So I'm just going to cover a few examples that are more specific to the field of biotechnology. So one of the areas that we work on in our lab involves immunoassays. And an immunoassay is a biochemical test which can measure the concentration of a substance uh, using an immunological reaction, as with an antibody. So diseases characterized by changes in protein concentrations in a patient's uh, physiological fluids can be tested for this way. And an ELISA test is one example of an assay which would be classified as a sandwich assay because it uses two different antibodies to detect a single antigen. So uh, using a sandwich assay can increase the specificity of a test. You would start with an immobilized capture antibody. You would flow a sample through containing some antigen that you want to detect. The antigen would bind here. Then you would flow another uh, liquid through, which contains a fluorescently labeled detection antibody, which also binds to the antigen. So you can see here that you need each of these steps in order to get a signal from your antigen. So it decreases the likelihood of receiving a, sim a signal from non-specific binding, which would be any protein binding to the antibody that you're not as interested in detecting. Uh, so, base, uh, so this is commonly done in labs and even in hospitals by using ELISA tests, which are performed by hand and can be time consuming as well as prone to human error. But by applying principles of microfluidics, uh, we can reduce the samples required, we can reduce the reagents consumed, and we can even multiplex the reaction to be able to detect multiple different protein concentrations in a single sample. And the way we would do that is by using a micro-mosaic immunoassay. So we can immobilize multiple different capture antibodies on a PDMS surface by flowing the capture antibody solution through these microchannels. Um, then we can flow a sample through channels crossing perpendicularly to the immobilized capture antibodies. Then we can follow that by flowing detection antibodies through. And when we remove this top layer here, what we end up with is uh, a grid of squares. And each square would represent the intersection of a different capture antibody with a detection antibody. And so this can give us a result like this one. And uh, we can imagine that a result like this could give us a lot of different, uh, different pieces of information about the presence and relative concentration of different proteins in a patient sample. So we're also going to learn more about this later because there is an experiment which we will participate in in Module 3. Look forward to that. Um, OK, so another example of microfluidic devices would be droplet-based microfluidics. So droplet-based microfluidics generate emulsions of different immiscible liquids by flowing an outer fluid into a channel and uh, also flowing the inner fluids, which are immiscible. So in this case, we also can, uh, we can make a more rigid droplet sheath by 
putting a, um, an unreacted monomer in our middle fluid and putting a crosslinker in our outer fluid. So basically what happens when the monomer comes in contact with the crosslinker is a polymerization reaction will occur at the surface of the droplet. And what you can end up with are these rigid sheets which contain an inner fluid in the middle. It's getting a little complicated here. Um, and in this inner fluid, you can have uh, your reactants of interest, uh, single cells, uh, genes, anything that you want to use to do your test. And so these droplets are really easily individually ma manipulated. Um, you can bring them to different sections of your microfluidic device. You can perturb uh, like environmental parameters, and um, they're really useful for high throughput screening assays. So that's just one example of uh, microfluidics device devices in, re in the research field. Oh, sorry, um, if you can go back, the yep. pinching off it just occurs uh, without any problems, regardless of what you put in the crosslink curve. Um, well, I think what happens is that the linking reaction does take a bit of time to start. And what you would have to do is uh, uh, you would have to manipulate the flow rate of the inner fluid and the middle fluid. You would have to find that sweet spot where you're getting the droplets of the size that you're looking for. Because as well, the flow rates do determine the size of the droplets. And um, the pul polymerization reaction would have to occur over some period of time. So it's not really an instantaneous thing. You probably would not see this pinching off area being a problem unless you had, you know, really slow flow rates, for example. Uh, so one other example of microfluidic devices is the isolation or detection of rare cells. So usually these rare cells would be pathogens or markers of disease. And in this case, uh, in this paper, they are detecting circulating tumor cells, which are markers for patients who are, um, are at risk for metastatic cancer or cancer relapse. So this uh, capture was accomplished by functionalizing these micro posts in a microfluidic chamber with EPCAM, which is an antibody specific to carcinoma cells. And by changing the geometry and spacing of the posts, as well as the flow rate of the sample through <coughs> this array, uh, we can optimize conditions to make the cell capture more likely. And so these uh, circulating tumor cells are exceedingly rare in blood. They're present at very, very low concentrations, but they are a very strong indicator of uh, the risk for cancer relapse. So in the future, um, these kind of devices could potentially be used for screening tools for doctors. Um, oops, sorry. And as well, uh, the very, very low concentration of these circulating tumor cells in patient fluids mean that macrofluidic methods are pretty ineffective at actually finding them, so you really do need a microfluidic method for isolating them. So uh, another example would be the in vitro modeling of physiological microsystems, such as this lung on a chip here. So in this uh, experiment, they designed these microfluidic channels with a membrane in the middle. And then they cultured human endothelial and epithelial cells on either side of this membrane. And then by applying vacuum to the control channels on the side, they were able to produce these mechanical stress and strain cycles, which mimicked breathing. And so they could study how these mechanical signals uh, affected the cells. And so these types of organ-on-a-chip systems could potentially be used for drug screening and toxicology. Uh, you, can, you can monitor the way that nanoparticles are taken up by these cells in these kind of like more close, uh, in these systems which are more closely modeling uh, a real physiological microsystem. So uh, finally, an example from our own lab is the microfluidic probe for perfusion of brain tissue slices. So the probe is made from a PDMS head here, and it contains injection and aspiration apertures, which can be, uh, in which uh, flow rates can be optimized to produce a confined flow. And this confined flow is almost like a pen writing on paper. It can be used to locally stimulate brain tissue slices, like that's how local the stimulation is. There's only a few cells inside this confined flow. And so this can be really useful 
to study the effects of neurotransmitters or drugs or toxins, and it can help us to better understand the effects at the single cell level. So eventually, uh, the aim of this technology is to be used in tissue regeneration by applying bioactive chemicals and being able to study tissue remodeling and see how this is working at the single cell level. So uh, that's it for my presentation, but I'm happy to take any questions that you might have. <laughs> yeah. uh, we have a channel with the smaller dimensions than 70 uh, micrometers. Would these concepts be changed or you can um, use the same concepts and techniques? Uh, I think, uh, well, I guess it depends on how small your channels really are. I like not familiar with how much they would be changed, uh, but I guess it would depend on like how small you're really going. Like you might run into a wall at some point where you would find it very difficult to produce flow or to retain control over your fluids. But again, you can play with channel dimensions and the wettability of the surface uh, to overcome these kind of effects. Uh, there are different pumping systems which you can use as well, which I think I think I owe is going to talk a little more about uh, pumping systems. So, uh, yeah. Um, I have another question. So, um, real life applications. Sure. Where, yeah. Uh, you talked about multiplexing. Mm -hmm. um, what's the like the real application of multiplexing? So, multiplexing. Uh, I guess the real advantage of that would be able would be being able to use a single chip to detect multiple different proteins. So um, I guess, for example, in breast cancer, you might have uh, multiple different biomarkers, which would give, uh, which would provide an indication of different outcomes of a cancer. So if you use a single chip and then you uh, had your signal and your readout and you saw, like, go, oh, this biomarker is at this concentration, but this one's at this concentration. So together, that gives you a better picture of uh, the prognosis of the disease. And I mean. You can actually tailor your treatment based on that because if you're dealing with a less aggressive cancer, you would want to use less harsh treatments, for example. Okay. So that's um, just one real life. What's the maximum number of chances that it's a practical life? <laughs> um, practically, practically I, I'm not sure. I think DNA microarrays use like a lot of different spots. Um, uh, the ones that we're going to be using in the lab are just uh, two different signals that we're going to be seeing. But uh, practically, I'm not sure. I mean, I guess it depends on the size of your chip, uh, like realistically, the number of biomarkers that you actually need to measure. I mean, like, you're not going to go for measuring like, all of the proteins that you can possibly find. <coughs> it's kind of limited to the number of biomarkers that you actually want to see. Um, I think that would be the practical limitation. Are there any other questions? Okay, so we're just going to take a minute to switch our computers over, and I'll pass you guys on to Io for the last presentation of the day. Yeah, so this is Io uh, Ruachu, and he'll be giving us an intro to soft lithography. All right. Hi, everybody. I'm just going to set up my computer. Um, I'm happy to announce we're closer to lunch than to the beginning of the day. So. <laughs> Thanks for your patience and attention. <laughs> 